I think it's important to understand not whether it's active or passive. I think the way we should see it is that uh, you know how is it that we can get more and more people you know investing in mutual fund products, right? I think that's important. And and when I think back and when I look back, I think that simplicity is something that you know is key, right? And so if we want say the next five crore, ten crore new investors to come into the capital markets through mutual fund products. the only way that they can do it is through simple products and the you know and 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 the simplest product for anybody to look at is passive products in the indian uh, you know in the indian markets and i think one of the things uh, one of the reasons why it didn't pick up was also the fact that passive schemes are bought they're not sold mm. right so no distributor goes no distributor or broker ever goes and talks about a passive scheme simply because of the fact that they're very low cost schemes and i think that is why it took time for retail investors uh, to kind of get hooked on to uh, passive schemes no one at any given point of time can say which asset class is going to move hello hi welcome to the brand new episode of know your fund manager in this series we'll walk you through the investment ideologies of fund managers in india Today we have with us Mr Vishal Jain the chief executive officer of Zero the AMC. He has more than 25 years of experience and has been in the passive investment journey since day 1 in India. We are here in his house in Bengaluru. I have a lot of questions to ask. So without any further ado, let's start the episode. Hi Vishal, thank you so much for having us here. Thanks for having me on this show Satya. It's my pleasure. Tell us how is it uh, moving from uh, Mumbai to Bangalore? Oh, it's been a well. I've been born and brought up in Bombay, um, so it's quite a big change um, from the hustle bustle of a busy city and a large city like Mumbai. Um, I think what takes the cake definitely is the weather, um, and that the atmosphere is much cleaner. Uh, you know, in a place like uh, you know Bangalore as compared to Bombay. So enjoying yeah. my journey as of now, and let's see how it goes. Yeah. And also, how is it having a headquarters, AMC headquarters, away from Mumbai, which is a very happening place in this uh, mutual fund? I mean, space. very different. I mean, uh, you know, Bangalore has got that young, uh, you know, buzzing crowd, uh, and you can see that vibe, uh, you know, all around. So it's 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 very different. Hmm. Um, you know, I like the fact that uh, you know the fintech industry is now getting into, um, you know, setting up AMCs. um you know and look forward to uh, you know the journey that's coming great great so which is worse traffic wise bangalore or bombay <laughs> i well i think both are equally bad <laughs> but uh, i think uh, you know in the sense that uh, bangalore i think has much you know wider roads bigger roads um so i would tend to think that uh, you know both cities are equal in that sense nice great so um in this series uh, vishal we want to bring out the ideology of a fund manager i'm sure that you know the personal life also reflects in the investing ideology of a fund manager so why don't you walk us through your childhood your education etc well so you know i'll start off maybe with uh, you know my family mm. uh, my father uh, you know was a lic lifetimer uh, so an insurance man you know right from the day he uh, started his work life uh, he was a post graduate in mathematics um, my mother uh, you know is a housewife and uh, you know we've uh, you know basically lived most of our life uh, you know in mumbai mm. um, and studied over there for most of uh, most of the period um, mm. so that's what you know we come from a you know very simple uh, middle class family um, i don't know if uh, you know you know what middle class families were saying in the 70s and 80s uh, but you know it wasn't as if money was in abundance yeah. um, we all kind of learned the value of money right from the time that uh, that we were young and um, i i i mean I, i think that's what it's been i mean since yeah. since then yeah money doesn't grow on trees that's what yeah, they say yeah, yeah. <laughs> right right why don't you tell us about your educational background as well so i am a graduate um, uh, i'm a science graduate uh, you know with specialization in maths and statistics hmm. okay and then move to the and and then i did my mba Uh, from the Goa Institute of Management. So, how was your relationship with money? Was like earlier. Um. Well, when we were small, I mean, uh, I think, uh, well, only well, two things that come to my mind. Um, one is the fact that uh, uh, you know my father was an insurance man, 
and so you know he kept uh, you know kind of instilling that uh, uh, you know that thing in us that you know ensure that you know whenever you grow up you have to have a medical policy you have to have an insurance policy um he was an avid investor in the stock markets uh, because i mean at that point of time obviously salaries uh, you know in the public sectors were not all that great so everyone looked at kind of earning that little bit extra through some other avenue that was possible mm. um so that was my first experience with say uh, you know the stock markets and uh, and things like that the second thing which he you know always kind of indirectly tried to tell us was you know save money i mean mm. that is what is going to uh, you know keep you uh, steady in bad times and uh, you know me and my brother he would give us you know a small bit of pocket money every every month and at the same time he gave us you know one earthen gulak you know that that, right. that you know that earthen pot where you could kind of save money and he said that you know i'm giving you this but ensure that you're saving money mm. and and that's how we learned the importance of saving um well me and my brother you know we would kind of plan out luckily we both were tall and we were thin uh, so the same clothes kind of fitted both of us and uh, you know we would save money to buy that t-shirt to buy that jeans to buy those clothes uh, you know that made us look you know that much better and uh, you know that's how we kind of started our journey of saving mm-hmm. what was your first instance of investing in a stock market what was um, the experience like my first experience was when uh, yeah, you know i joined my work life in 96 mm. and uh, my father kind of asked me to invest in a couple of ipos mm. and that's when i kind of started my uh, journey of investing uh, my experience wasn't great at that point of time because the stocks that he told me didn't do too well okay. um, honestly um, i think when i i i actually started uh, you know getting a feel of the stock markets once um, you know i joined crisl where i was part of the index division and i had started working on indices and construction of indices um and that venture then got hived off into a joint venture between crisl and the national stock exchange and i was inside the national stock exchange for nearly uh, you know 2 years and that's where you know that kind of interest uh, in the stock markets kind of grew further at that point of time uh, uh derivatives had not started Uh, you know we were trying to push index derivatives started talking to people you know before the launch in the year 2000 uh, once derivatives got launched in the year 2000 um that's when i kind of started uh, you know looking at the stock markets a little more deeply initial years you know what it's like i mean you're only earning that much of money whatever you earn it tends to get over by the end of the month right yeah <laughs> so you I don't have any experience. yeah so you don't have any space in that sense to invest for the long term um taking leverage something that excited me at that point of time because you know if i could put 20000 rupees and take 2 lakhs worth of exposure i thought that's really great and that's how you know i started you know dabbling into the stock markets were you a successful trader um not really uh initial days uh, you know it's i i did well in the sense that um, uh the india was going through a secular bull run all the way between say 2001 to till the financial crisis and uh, um my initial trades that i used to do that is the buying and selling that i used to do uh, in derivatives i did make a lot of money until one day came when all of that got wiped out and probably much more than that and that's mm. when i pulled back and you know then said that look there's something that's not working right for me here um and i stayed away from the markets uh, you know for a while post that so my mm-hmm. initial experience uh you know wasn't great um and therefore uh, you know i i then slowly slowly because i was part of uh, benchmark mutual fund and because i was exposed to etfs and index funds at that point of time i slowly slowly started investing for the long term i think that is what has held me in good stead you know over a period of time i understand mm-hmm. when did you completely move towards passive i'm sure you must have tried investing in some stocks as you said when did you move towards passive entirely so as i mentioned for your personal you, yeah so i you know as i told you you know my initial experience with stocks wasn't great um my initial experience with trading uh, in the stock markets you know again wasn't great i then started uh, you know thinking that maybe somebody else knows more than me and mm. i started investing in a lot of uh, you know active schemes that were there at that point of time i somehow found that every time i'd invest in a particular scheme 
uh, that scheme would kind of start underperforming. You know, that didn't work as well. Um, and therefore, you know, then I fell back on what I was actually doing in terms of my job. In terms of, so at that point of time, uh, you know, when Benchmark Mutual Fund was launched, um, we had invested the first ETF, we had launched the first ETF in India, which was a Nifty 50 ETF, popularly called as Nifty Bs yeah. uh, today. And um, I started slowly, slowly building my corpus in that scheme. And, uh, you know, somehow I bought my first car, uh, you know, investing in Nifty Bs. I bought my first house because of, uh, you know, the investments that I made in Nifty Bs. So I think that's kind of worked for me over a period of time. So talking about this uh, passive industry, tell us what is a passive fund manager do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, people think that uh, being a passive fund manager is easy. But, uh, you know, I think it's an extremely difficult job and I'll tell you why. Um, one of the big things is that a passive fund manager is watched day after day, right? Um, every day, day after day, I have to track the index as mm. it is, right? And if I've made a mistake somewhere, it shows up today, it doesn't show up tomorrow. Right, so and everyone's tracking me on a day-to-day -day basis. That doesn't happen with an active fund manager. An active fund manager, you invest in a fund manager, you tend to give him that two or three years to see whether he's performing in the markets or not. Right. So an active fund manager's job is that he has to track the index on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis, what is it that you're doing? Um, you're ensuring that your corpus mm -hmm. is tracking the index, is hugging the index as closely as possible. Um, the second thing is you have to ensure that any kind of subscriptions or redemptions that are coming uh, in the fund that you ensure, you know, that you're ensuring that you're meeting those subscriptions and redemptions. Uh, the third thing is corporate actions that come into the index. Now that is big. So companies mm. that are issuing rights issues, bonus issues, splits, mm. all those things have to be adjusted in the scheme, ensuring that there is not too much of um, tracking error. Fourth big thing is the rebalances that happen in an index. So every six months, there are companies that come in and go out of the index. So you have to ensure that you're rebalancing the index to the best of your ability to ensure that you're not getting hit in terms of tracking error and, um, you know, an impact on the returns for the end investor because of the rebalancing that's happening, uh, you know, in the index. And that's a very important skill that a passive ma manager brings. Yeah. Why don't you explain simply what a tracking error is? So tracking error is a statistical measure mm. uh, which calculates, uh, well, basically in terms of technical terms, it's the standard deviation of difference between returns of an index and returns of, you know, of your scheme. So let's take a simple example that today the index goes up by 1% and your scheme goes up by 0.98%. So 0.02% is the tracking difference for that day. Now, when you look at it over a long period of time, all those differences, the standard deviation of all those differences over the last one year is what you called as, what is called as a tracking error of the scheme. Mm. What does it matter to uh, a retail investor? How does he or she read the tracking error? So, it's a very important number. Um, tracking error generally is, um, you know, is all encompassing in the sense that whether it's expense ratio of a scheme, or whether it is, uh, you know, the way the fund manager is tracking uh, the scheme all gets shown in that one number, right? Mm. So the lower the tracking error of any scheme, mm. the better it is. Typically, mm. you will find that large cap, you know, nifty based ETFs uh, generally have a tracking error of 0.02% to 0.05% or so. And the other indices, which are the mid cap, uh, you know, and the small cap and the other indices that you may have might have a slightly larger tracking error depend on, depending on how it's kind of managed by that particular fund house or the or the fund manager who's managing that scheme. The liquidity is also important for the index fund managers as well to buy and sell. And if a particular stock is not available and it's not liquid enough, then again, there would be an impact cost for the index fund. So will the tracking difference be higher for these small cap funds? Well, that's a very good question that you asked. And you're right about that, that, uh, you know, the tracking difference and the tracking error could be higher 
uh, you know, for mid cap schemes and small cap schemes. Um, I think the biggest reason, I think one of the biggest reasons, one thing is liquidity in the underlyings. I think liquidity in the underlyings is not too bad at this point of time. Mid caps are trading about 20,000 crores a day. Small caps are trading about 15,000 crores a day. So I don't think per se liquidity is such a big issue. I think the bigger issue is the churn in the indices. I think the indices such as the small cap indices will typically find a larger churn than, you know, the evolved, uh, you know, large cap or to an extent even the mid cap companies. What I'm basically trying to say is that say in a mid cap or say in a small cap 250 index, um, rebalance is done every six months, right? Typically in that rebalance, you'll find nearly 10 to 15% of the companies coming in and going out. Now that's a big churn, right? right. And that is the impact that a passive fund manager or an mm. investor has to pay because of the fact that he has to tell, you know, sell so many stocks in the market and then buy so many stocks, mm. uh, uh, you know, to ensure that he's tracking the index. And I think that can lead to a higher tracking error uh, in small caps and to an extent in mid caps as well. Mm. What is the ideal, uh, what is the threshold for the tracking error or the tracking difference that one can look at? Um, see, SEBI mandates that, uh, you know, you have to manage your tracking error below 2%. Uh, but I think that most fund houses are now closely managing their schemes. So I don't think the tracking error would be too high. Uh, I don't have numbers with me, to be honest with you. Uh, but I think that obviously the tracking error will be very low for, uh, you know, Nifty 50 and Nifty 100 kind of ETFs. And it'll start getting, you know, slightly... Uh, higher when you move towards mid cap and the uh, you know and the small cap uh, index funds and ETFs. And uh, would you be comfortable with a micro cap in the index fund or the passive fund space? Um, personally, no. Um, personally, again, personally, no, because I uh, my portfolio is generally tilted towards you know being conservative. Again, as I mentioned to you. In a micro cap index, the churn could possibly be higher than even a small cap index. So the error, the tracking error in a micro cap index um, can be high. I don't have the numbers with me. So as long as investors are okay with the higher tracking error and uh, the risk that comes with investing in micro cap stocks, I think as long as they're aware of those risks, it's fine to invest in them. Mm. Yeah. When it comes to active fund managers, there is a style, there is, you know, past performance, etc. to understand the ideology of a fund manager. When it comes to a passive fund manager, how do we distinguish between one passive fund manager to another? I think, again, tracking error is a very big number that people should track. Um, tracking error figures are now, uh, you, uh, you know, disseminated through the fact sheets and even on the websites. And I think that's one figure that, uh, you know, investors should keep looking at to judge uh, how one's, one, uh, you know, passive fund is better from the other passive fund. Uh, tell us, uh, how did you evolve as a passive fund manager in this industry? You've been in this industry since day one. Uh, it's almost 20 years, yeah. 20, 23 years. How is it like, how did you evolve as a passive fund manager in this space? I think, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, helped me early on in my life was the fact that I was exposed to indices, mm. right? Um, I understood the way indices are constructed. I understood the way indices are calculated. I understood what happens when corporate, corporate actions come and go inside an index and how it is uh, adjusted. I think that is something that, uh, you know, uh, is the first stepping stone for me, uh, you know, to move into fund management. I always sat back and thought at that point of time that, look, I know how to construct an index. I know how to manage an index. I know what is required to do all that. But how can I use this for, you know, launching money on that scheme um, between the 95s and 2000s i think what had happened was the fact that index investing whether it was index derivatives index futures uh, you know money getting launched on index funds uh, money getting launched on exchange traded funds all that has sort of kind of gaining ground right and that kind of interested me a lot luckily what happened was um, i was fortunate enough to meet you know a bunch of uh, uh, you know very forward looking guys uh, the promoters of, uh, you know, Benchmark Mutual Fund, Sanjeev Shah, Rajan Mehta and Sanjay Gai Tonde. And, uh, you know, and that's how the birth of, you know, Benchmark Mutual Fund started and we launched the first ETF, right? I think uh, the fact that they give me an opportunity, uh, you know, to help them uh, launch this mutual fund and then to take over the investment 
part of those uh, ETFs. I think uh, you know helped me understand a lot about investments. Um, as I mentioned to you, a big thing was that I already knew how indices were being calculated, and uh, it became that much more easier for me to kind of uh, you know then manage uh, an index fund or an ETF at that point of time. One thing, one important point that comes to mind is how technology over a long period of time has kind of helped a passive fund manager. I still remember way back in 2001, um, you know, NSE didn't even have uh, a way to hit a 50 stock basket. So we actually approached NSE, uh, you know, to create a small module for us, uh, mm. you know, to help us hit one single, you know, a basket full of 50 securities. And uh, today that you know, system that they created is popular, popularly called as an offline entry module in the NSE terminal. But technology was such at that point of time that a 50 stock basket would take nearly about a minute, minute and a half to go through the exchange platform. Today, even a 500 stock index mm. basket goes through in a split second, mm. you know. So that's how kind of technology has helped you to manage, uh, you know, passive schemes from mm. what it was say in the year 2001 to what it is, uh, you know, nearly two decades later. Yeah. Passives have gained traction only in the last few years. So how is it, you know, being in that space for a long time when, you know, you never know whether passive will pick up in India or not. How is it being in the space without knowing whether it will work out in India or not? So it was a struggle. Mm. Um, I still remember, you know, in the early days when we launched Nifty Bees, I still remember that, uh, you know, we were all sitting across the table and we said that, you know, this product is so beautiful, it's going to be 500 crores in, in, in six months time. And Nifty B is, if I remember correctly, crossed 500 crores, you know, nearly, I would say 15 years later. So mm. it was a tough journey. Um, initially, uh, you know, obviously all of us, you know, kind of wondered as to why, uh, you know, ETFs are not picking up in the Indian, uh, you know, in the Indian markets. And I think... One of the things, uh, one of the reasons why it didn't pick up was also the fact that passive schemes are bought, they're not sold, mm. right? So no distributor goes, no distributor or broker ever goes and talks about a passive scheme simply because of the fact that they're very low cost schemes. And I think mm. that is why it took time for retail investors uh, to kind of get hooked on to uh, passive schemes. I think the inflection point came in 2018. Uh, when SEBI made two big changes, uh, you know, in the regulations. Um, one of the big changes that they made in 2018 was that all mutual fund schemes, you know, have to, uh, you know, calculate or benchmark versus the total returns index and not the price index, right? Mm. Now, the difference between the total returns index and the price index is simply that what you see on TV mm. is the price index, mm. right? But there is also another index. So, for example, Nifty or a Sensex, has a price index mm. and has a total returns index as well. The total returns index also has dividends inside that index, right? Now, typically the difference in returns between a total return index and a price index is about 1 to 1.25% when it comes to large cap schemes. Now, what was happening all, all along was that most active fund managers were benchmarking versus the price index and the extra 1, 1.25%, which was coming in the form of dividends from those schemes, was being shown as alpha that was being generated, which was wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. SEBI corrected that uh, in the year 2018. So that is one big thing that happened. The second thing that happened was that SEBI, uh, you know, did categorization of mutual fund schemes, which means that there was a point of time when, for example, you had schemes called as blue chip, which kind of gave a feeling that these are large cap schemes of blue chip companies, but maybe 30-35% of that was going into you know, mid cap stocks, but the benchmarking was happening with a large cap index and therefore it was being showed as, you know, there is outperformance that's happening. So SEBI then corrected that and said that, look, you know, if you're a large cap scheme, you can only invest in these 20, uh, these 100 companies that are there. Still, you had an option. Still, even today, a fund manager has an option to invest 20% of that money in uh, non-large caps, which are mid caps as well. Similarly, SEBI defined that stocks between 101 to 250 are mid cap, between 251 to 500 are small caps, right? And so when this categorization happened and data started coming, you know, from 2019 onwards, it was very apparent that the active schemes, most of the active schemes, when benchmarking was done correctly, were underperforming their benchmarks. And that's when, uh, you know, realization came 
uh, you know, in the market that look, you know, what is the point of paying such high expense ratios uh, to these active schemes when oh. you're not assured or you're not guaranteed, you know, that they're going to be beating the index. And I, I think that was a big inflection point mm. after which you will find that AUMs and passive, which whether it's index funds or ETFs, shot up. I'm sure COVID also helped, right? COVID definitely did help. COVID definitely did help because you found a lot of new people coming into the markets mm. and they wanted an easy way to invest money. Um, and I, uh, you know, that was a big inflection point. So even something like, you know, a Nifty Bs and all the ETFs that were lifted, we, saw, we found a huge number of new investors coming into the market mm. because at that point of time, what happens is when an event like COVID happens, you are not too sure about which sector of stock to buy at that point of time because you don't know what is getting impacted. Right. But an index or an ETF is the simplest thing for you to invest at that point of time right. to execute your, you know, your whatever exposure that you want to take. So, yes, we did find a lot of people coming into the uh, ETF and index funds at that point of time. Hmm. Talking about your journey as a fund manager, uh, were there any mistakes, you know, you did professionally and you've learned from them? Mistakes are inevitable uh, or any lessons that you've learned over the years well, about I think, investing? Well, I think... The biggest lesson that I learned was when I started trading in derivatives and I lost uh, a lot of money. I think that for me, I feel was an inflection point. I'm happy it, you know, happened early in my life. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, you guys must have heard George Soros, you know, who's a famed value investor. You know, he said that if investing is entertaining, if you're having fun, then obviously you're not making too much money. You mm -hmm. know, good investing is boring. And, uh, you know, I think I understand what he's saying now, you know, so I learned from that mistake. Yeah. I'm happy I learned that earlier on in life. Um, and that, uh, you know, helped me, uh, you know, kind of discipline the way I was investing. I think mm. that was a big inflection point in my life. Any biggest lessons as a fund manager managing people's money? Um, I think I, I think one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, I felt makes sense. Uh, you know, is uh, um, having some kind of, you know, asset allocation in your portfolio. So, uh, when we started off Benchmark, um, for the first decade, we launched a number of schemes, right? And, uh, you know, we launched a number of uh, equity ETFs. We then launched debt ETFs. We then launched commodity ETFs. And, uh, you know, I think one of the learnings that I had is that no one at any given point of time can say which asset class is going to move, you know. So you might sit there and think that, look, I don't believe in gold or I don't believe in debt and I believe only in equity. There will be a point of time when debt will move. There will be a point of time, you know, when uh, gold will move and there will be a point of time when equity will move. And I think uh, what I've learned over a period of time is that to build a portfolio that has a decent mix of various asset classes, I think that's been a big learning for me. Uh, over the years as a fund manager and also as a person, uh, you know, who kind of uses that knowledge to build a personal portfolio as well. So asset allocation is the key. Yes, yeah. I think so. They say that asset al al allocation is the only free lunch you can get in investing <laughs> because you're beautiful. diversifying. Uh, <laughs> I haven't heard yeah, this. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, Michelle, let's also talk about uh, Zero the AMC a bit. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be very interested in knowing what uh, is up. Um, when it is launched, there were parallels drawn to Vanguard in uh, in the USA. So, um, is this deliberately discussed in the vision statement of Zero the AMC? Well, it's not. I don't think it's a deliberate uh, thing. Um, I think the objective being that we believe there's still a lot that can be done in the mutual fund space. Um, um, when you look at, uh, you know, uh, numbers like, uh, you know, unique pan folios. Today, you're touching a unique pan folio of about 4 crores, okay, in a population of 140 crores, right? And uh, I think there's a lot more that can be done. I mean, if we're talking about India becoming a developed economy, mm. if we're talking about, you know, India becoming a 5 trillion, 7 trillion dollar economy, it cannot happen without more and more people getting involved in financial inclusion getting involved in bringing out their savings into financial products and those then going, uh, you know, into the, uh, you know, getting channeled into into the economy. And I think our objective is, uh, the way we look at it is how, how can we get more and more people investing indirectly or directly into 
the capital markets and benefit from it i think that's the objective so mm. if if you were to ask me what is our main objective i mean i want to see how we can get the next 10 crore new investors into the capital markets through mutual fund products over the next couple of years and mm. i think that's what we're working on so mostly it will be targeting the tier 2 and tier 3 cities i think we'll be targeting uh, you know i think our main focus area will be retail investors and uh, you know we will be a purely uh, you know digital fund house and therefore we'll be using uh, you know digital platforms um, and digital integrations to reach out to as many people as we can um, uh, you know as many investors as we can over a period of time do you see passive industry in india uh, gaining the traction that ha- that us had in the near future um i don't see any reason why it shouldn't go that way i mean if you look at even data um in a short span of about 4 5 years um passive aum is nearly 15% of the total aum right and when you look at only equity we are at about maybe 25 30% and i think it's important to understand not whether it's active or passive i think the way we should see it is that uh, you know how is it that we can get more and more people you know investing in mutual fund products right i think that's important and and when i think back and when i look back i think that simplicity is something that you know is key right and so if we want say the next 5 crore 10 crore new investors to come into the capital markets through mutual fund products the only way that they can do it is through simple products and the you know and 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 the simplest product for anybody to look at is passive products because when you go and tell someone look that you know these are the you know 50 companies which the best companies in india which comprise the index i mean it's very easy for someone to understand okay so passive is transparent uh passive is versatile it can fit into your portfolio in a very simple manner uh passive is co- cost effective and you know so it fits all the bells and whistles uh you know for a retail investor and i think that's where the growth is going to happen uh you know indian mar- uh, you know in the indian market so i see passive gaining far more traction in the coming years because i think it's a very natural progression for investors to start investing starting their investing journey through products like uh, you know index funds and etfs now it's about 15% of the aum total aum in the that's correct mutual fund industry yeah and in the us i guess it is up to 50% yeah in the us it's 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 far larger uh, but us has a head start hmm. of you know nearly 5 decades or so yeah uh, but i think india is going to uh, you know catch up fast and uh, uh, you know because i believe that uh, for more and more people you know for them to adopt uh, you know financial products um i think i personally think it's the simplest uh, you know avenue or an entry point for people to start Hmm. And equity is the only product that can beat inflation in the long run. Well, as an yeah. asset class, yes, yeah. possibly. Right, right. Let's talk about the passive investing, the cons, pros and cons of the passive investing. The whole premise of passive investing is that active fund management or um active stock picking cannot be cannot beat the uh, market. So what is your opinion? Um uh, can we not beat the market by going active in the fund space or by active stock picking yeah, i i don't know if that's the right way to look at it um i think what is important is to understand first what a market is right a market is basically a you know a community of people uh, who are investing in uh, you know various stocks and shares what you call as the stock exchange right now to me a market is much larger than an individual right to me if you look at the stock markets today uh, the stock markets to me is like an information gobbling machine you know information comes into the market it gets discounted in a split second right today if a stock like let's take a simple example i'm not very sure what reliance trading but but if i'm but if i have my numbers right might be trading at about you know 2475 to the let's take a simple example that is trading at 2500 today if it's trading at 2500 is because the entire market believes that this is what the value of the stock should be at this point of time it's not an individual it's the collective wisdom of the market that decides this should be the valuation of the stock and i as an active uh, you know fund manager is just one person you know in the entire market you know who is giving information to that stock so i think that it's a very difficult job uh, i mean think about what an active fund manager has to do day after day day after day he has to keep outguessing or everybody else in the market 
I mean, is it even possible to do that? So I think it's a difficult job for anyone to do. Um, I think the market is much larger. I think the net, what I'm trying to say is a much, a market is much larger than a single person. Hmm. I understand your point of view in the large cap segment, where there's a lot of information available and a lot of researchers, a lot of analysts are tracking it. But what about the mid cap and the small cap space where the research is also limited, where there is a scope for price discoveries, what we have believed for a long time? What do you say about that? I mean, I think, look, liquidity has improved across the Indian markets. I mean, look at the amount of trading that's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Large caps are trading 30,000 crores a day. Mid caps are trading 20,000 crores a day. Small caps are trading 15,000 crores a day. Those are big numbers, You're right? And this is per day, right? So I think it's very difficult. I think markets are a market. I think Indian markets are pretty large right now, you know, and they're going to keep getting uh, bigger as we move ahead. I think there, there will always be sectors, segments, themes, fund managers who will keep doing well at a certain point of time. I think the issue is, was I able to pick the right stock? I mean, if, if I asked you that among 250 stocks, which stock do you think is going to do well? I mean, how many times will you get it right? Right. I think people should, you know, evaluate that and then accordingly take a call whether they prefer going through an index or through a uh, through stock picking mm -hmm. or through an active fund manager. So, in your opinion, passive is the only way to go for investor? Well, I think passive makes sense. Um, I think, uh, you know, at no given point of time, am I saying that, uh, you know, uh, investors should not look at uh, other ways to make money. Um, I think it's very important that um, any individual, okay, uh, should focus on building a disciplined, uh, you know, portfolio, right? And it can be a mix of active, it can be a mix of passive. I think that one thing that works well is to split your portfolio in a core and satellite approach, right? Uh, the core approach is possibly the larger part of your portfolio. We are saying where you can take exposure through, you know, low cost passive schemes, uh, a small part of your portfolio, which we call as a satellite portion, um, where you believe that maybe you're able to pick the right fund manager, or you're able to pick the right stock, or any other kind of alternative investment should form a smaller part of your portfolio, which we term as a satellite portfolio. Now, investors, depending on their risk appetite, can split this the way they want. So, for example, if I'm a very conservative investor, the core part of my portfolio, which I'm exposing towards a plain vanilla diversified index funds or ETFs can be 80% of my portfolio and the satellite portion can be 20%. But if you're an investor who's willing to take more risk, then it can be a 60-40 mix. So you can decide how you want to do it. But I think it's important that people should build some kind of discipline in the portfolio. I think that is what, um, uh, you know, investors should focus on. I think we've come from a, a place where it is active versus passive to active and passive in the portfolio. That's correct. So I think investors should look at both. Um, the only difference uh, in say a passive form of investing is that in any passive product, it's passive products are very versatile, right? So let's take a simple example that, uh, you know, you have a portfolio now and you have a portfolio, let's take a simple example of 20 mid cap stocks. Everybody at this point of time knows that look, you know, the markets are at the peak and in everybody's mind, there is some fear right, that there is a likelihood that either markets will remain stagnant or there could be some event that can bring the markets down. Now, what does an investor do? Will you go and sell all those 20, 30 mid cap stocks that you have? Not a very desirable thing for you to do, right? You don't want to get out of those stocks. One way to reduce your, reduce your risk is to possibly buy a gold ETF. Why a gold ETF? Because gold is negatively correlated with equity. So the day you include a simple thing like a gold ETF in your portfolio, you've automatically reduced the risk of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Second thing that you do, okay, you may not, uh, you know, want to invest in a commodity asset class called gold. You want to do it in equity. By buying a large cap ETF, you can buy a large cap ETF, include that as a stock in your portfolio and automatically the reduce, uh, you know, the risk reduces in your portfolio. So the beauty of a passive product is that it can fit anyone's portfolio. You can build a portfolio only of passive products. If you're an active stock picker, you can still use passive products, uh, you know, to tweak your portfolio the way you want. Uh, so to me, you know, it's a win-win for everyone, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. 
we talked about ETFs a lot, which are exchange traded funds. Why don't you uh, simply uh, tell us what is the difference between an index fund and an ETF? Okay. An ETF is basically a mutual fund unit, which investors can buy and sell on the stock market at real time prices. So typically in an index fund structure or a regular mutual fund, a traditional mutual fund structure, you could invest money, but only at the closing NAV of the scheme, you know, which is declared, uh, you know, late in the night. In an ETF, let's take a simple example that you come in today and the market is say 1% down, you could actually buy that particular ETF at approximately 1% lower. So ETFs gives you that ability to be able to buy at a real time price, you know, in the stock markets. So what's the difference between an index fund and an ETF for an investor? So for an investor, again, I would prefer not to go too much, uh, you know, into technicals. I think both are passive products. Both allow you to, um, you know, take exposure to a diversified uh, basket of stocks. Um, if you are a regular trader in the stock markets and you have a DMAT account and a broking account, then I think you should take exposure to passive products through ETFs. Um, if you are not, uh, you know, too into, uh, you know, investing in the stock markets, then it's better for you to take exposure through an index fund. Uh, in an index fund, it's typically better and easier for you to even do SIPs. Um, so, I mean, that's the basic, I would say, you know, overall difference between the two products. But through the broker, one can also initiate SIP in the ETFs as well. You can. So, a lot of brokers are now giving that option. Uh, for investors to, uh, you know, do SIPs and stocks and therefore in ETFs as well. I mean, if that makes sense for you, uh, ETF is, uh, it, it, you know, can be a good route for you as well. And all the index fund products will be available in the ETF space as well, mostly? Not always, but huh. typically all the large diversified indices are available through an ETF as well as an index fund now. When we talk about ETFs, the biggest concern is the liquidity that uh, there wouldn't be enough liquidity when a person wants to buy or sell and which could impact the price at which it is bought or sold and it's called an impact cost um, so why don't you talk about the liquidity a bit and also the impact cost sure so i think one very important feature um, you know of an etf is uh, the existing of this person called um, you know as a market maker right who is a market maker a market maker is basically a person who is giving two way quotes, you know, on that particular ETF. Now, when you look at, when you step back a little bit um, and look at what's happened in the Indian markets, India per se as a country didn't, doesn't have a very strong uh, market making ecosystem, unlike, uh, you know, international markets. And therefore, you found that liquidity in ETFs uh, is very high in international markets as compared to the Indian markets. Um, now, when you look at how ETFs have, have grown, right, there are two ways for somebody to create an ETF. One is you can directly approach the AMC, right, and create units in bulk with the AMC, or you can go into the, uh, to the retail market uh, or into the stock market and buy retail lots, right. Now, invariably what happened in the Indian market is that it was easier for institutional investors to directly approach the AMC and create units with the AMC and therefore that part of the liquidity never got stored in the stock markets. So what you meant by creating units is they're buying the units through the AMC itself. That's correct. And not on That's the secondary correct. market. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Right. And therefore that became kind of the preferred route and is the preferred route today as well. Now what has the Indian market or what has say uh, the industry with the regulator, what are the changes that have happened, uh, you know, in the last uh, year or so? So one very important thing is, uh, has happened. Now, SEBI has come up with a regulation stating that only if you are buying more than 25 crores can you directly approach um, the AMC, right? Mm. So anything below 25 crores has to be traded on the stock markets. Now, I think that the, that regulation is going to have a very strong impact on liquidity in the coming years. And I think you'll find that uh, liquidity in ETS will grow up manifold Mm -hmm. uh, in the coming years because of this one change uh, that has happened. So definitely you will see liquidity improving in a lot of ETFs that are there. Um, diversified ETFs will always have more liquidity than thematic ones. Mm -hmm. um, another big thing is that it is now mandatory for AMCs to display an indicative NAV of that ETF on their website. So investors can actually go on to the AMC websites 
look at that indicative NAV and trade accordingly. Uh, you know, on in the stock markets based on the NAV that they see. Hmm. They can compare with the NAV That's and correct. the price. That's correct. That is there on the stock exchange. Yeah. Right. So, how is the liquidity <clears throat> now? So, is as it I good enough you, for a retail investor to yes, invest in so I So, in diversified products, um, like Nifty based products or a Nifty 100 or a, you know, or a diversified ETF that is there, I think liquidity is quite sufficient for retail investors, uh, you know, to get in and get out. I don't see an issue there. The issue can be in some of the thematic ETFs or some of the sector ETFs that may be there. Hmm. So, how do a retail investor know whether the liquidity is good or not uh, for a particular ETF? What is the quantity? What is the uh, what is the value that we, that they should see? See, I think different ETFs, uh, you know, will trade differently. Um, as I mentioned to you, the best thing to do is to look at the indicative NAV on the website of, uh, you know, a particular AMC mm. and then go and place a limit order uh, for buying or selling on the counter, right? Mm. I think that's the best way for investors to trade in those ETFs which are not very liquid. Right, right. And what is the impact of the low liquidity? Impact cost is basically, uh, you know, the, the additional charge that someone needs to pay over and above the NAV to take, you know, uh, to take exposure to the particular product. So let's take a simple example that the NAV of anything or of, of a particular ETF, ETF is 100. And I finally, you know, land up buying my quantity at 100.50. Then 50 paisa is actually what is the impact I've paid for buying that ETF. Hmm. Could you also give uh, some understanding of what smart beta funds are and how are they performing in India? What's the future for that? So I think again, uh, it, it's you know it's important to understand firstly you know what beta is, hmm. um, and then possibly come to you know whether smart beta is the right word or you know better beta is the right word. I mean I don't know uh, what is the right word, but beta basically is a statistical measure um, that shows you volatility of a certain stock versus a diversified index. Right now if the beta is more than one, it means that the stock is more volatile than the diversified index. If it's less than one, it is less volatile than a diversified index. Now, when you move away from a traditional market cap based index, mm. right, um, you then, with, where, where you come back and say that, look, you know, okay, these are 50 companies or these are 100 companies in an index and they are weighted based on pure market cap or free float market cap as they call it, um, you come back and say that, look, you know, from these 100 companies, I want to only pick a certain number of companies based on some factor, which they call as factors, which can be a momentum factor or a value factor or a fundamental factor. Now, those become what you term as smart beta, right? Um, so, when you move away from a traditional market cap based you know, index um, or a calculation methodology, uh, you then come to a bunch of stocks which you believe, in a sense, is going to beat, you know, the original index that, it, you know, that is it is being culled out from. Now, like any other strategy, you know, a smart beta index is also exposed to outperformance and underperformance, mm -hmm. um, very much like an active fund manager, right? Now, my belief is that you should look at smart beta products. They can form a part of your portfolio mm. as long as they form a part of the satellite portion of your portfolio is what I would tend to think. So, what do you think about the <coughs> index methodology in India? How are the weightages of different stocks as a time? So, it's important. It's important to understand that, look, you know, weightages. So, when you look at traditional market cap based indices, I mean, let's take a simple example, like say the Nifty 50 or the BSC Sensex. It's not the index service provider who decides the weightages. The weightages are decided by the market. I mean, how are weightages calculated? Weightages are calculated based on market capitalization, right? What is market capitalization? Market capitalization is price of a stock multiplied by number of outstanding equity shares that the company has issued out in the market, right? Now, those shares are typically constant. So what changes is the price? Who defines the price? It's the market. Right. It's the collective wisdom of the market that decides the price. And that is what is used to calculate an index. Right. Mm -hmm. So,
people have to understand that look an index okay the weightages of an index is decided by you as an investing class not by the index service provider mm. right we all together are part of the market and we decide what the price of that particular stock is going to be what the value of that particular company is going to be and that value is what is used to calculate an index mm. right mm. and that methodology that is being used in india is it's it's an inter international methodology that is being used across the world i mean our index service providers are as good or i would say even better as compared to uh, you know other international players in the market sure now let's talk about the critics of passive investments um so there are a lot of um, reports research reports that suggest that money flowing into the passive funds is creating a bubble in the market as long as people keep earning money in the form of salary or keep investing through sips the money keeps flowing the money keeps flowing into the same number of stocks that an index has and this would in the long run distort the prices of the stock prices is what the argument is of course passive is a very good product for investor but is there a impact on the stock market in the long run that there would be a distortion in the prices of the stocks in the index which would not reflect the intrinsic value of those stocks <coughs> i think i think it's important to again go back to the construct of a market you know i don't know how these arguments uh, you know to be honest come about um what is a market a market is you know the collective wisdom of all the people in the market you know which includes index funds include active funds and many more people who are there in the market right the market today is trading nearly about 50 to 60000 crores in the cash market uh in the derivatives market you are trading about you know 1 lakh crores or so right so collectively the market volume is about 1.5 to 1.6 lakh crores per day how much are passive funds contributing to that right forget passive funds how much are how much is the mutual fund industry contributing to that on a daily basis now right? it is a very small size i agree But, but maybe in the west or maybe going forward in india as well but you are still one segment of the market right the mutual fund industry per se as a whole is only one segment of the market right if you look at even the even in the indian context today the total aums in the entire in mutual fund industry is 47 lakh crore you are trading 1.5 lakh crore every day in the stock markets which means what you've accumulated in aum over the last 30 years you will trade that in just 30 days time so can you imagine that the market is far far larger than just the mutual fund industry per se right and it's not the mutual fund industry or an active fund manager or passive fund manager that decides the price of that one stock he is just another person who adds value to the price of that stock right that's the first thing right and that's i think that's an important thing that everyone has to understand that the market is right the market will keep humbling you at every given point of time and you have to understand that right the second big thing is that for every buyer there is a seller right which means if i am getting a flow in a passive fund and i am buying there is a guy on the other side who's already taking a counter view on that on that particular stock so how does that argument hold third thing what stops an active fund manager from selling a stock if it's not fundamentally valued properly nobody is nobody is stopping him in fact i think active fund managers have far greater leeway than a passive fund manager let's take a simple example you have a 100 crore passive fund let's take a simple example that there, there is a stock like maybe let's take mahindra and mahindra which might be 1% of that index as a passive fund manager the exposure that i can take to mahindra and mahindra is 1 crore an active fund manager if he believes that because of passive flows that are coming into that stock that the stock is going to keep going up he can buy all the way up to 10% of his portfolio so what is stopping him from outbeating that index is what i don't understand so i don't believe in these arguments i think these are just excuses that people make 
it doesn't yeah. make logical sense to me okay it's just that the premise of the whole stock market will be disturbed is what the argument is that uh capital will not be efficiently allocated to good companies is the argument but uh, yeah as you said it doesn't uh, comprise a large significant portion of the overall uh no i still think flows. the market is far larger than just one philosophy or one bunch of people and the market will keep humbling you again and again you know and 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 i think that uh, you know that's something that you know everyone has to understand that it's not as if passive is going to work all the time it's not as if active is going to work all, all you know all the time it's not as if you know uh, stock picking is going to work all the time or you know there will be uh, different philosophies and different theories that will work at different points of time you have to understand what makes sense for you and what works for you as an individual now coming to your personal investments vishal so where do you invest so i again um after all the learnings and beatings that i've taken in the market as i told you i mean i i have a very simple portfolio um i don't uh, you know like investing in too many stocks or too many securities in that sense um, i try and restrict the number of entries in my dmat account to about 5 um i like having an asset allocation in my portfolio so i generally like investing in broad based etfs uh, and i like having a bit of gold in that as well because gold is negatively correlated to um, uh, to equity so generally when the markets are down uh, it tends to kind of protect you to an extent um i don't like to tweak my portfolio beyond a point so i like to build a portfolio and keep investing in that portfolio for a period of about 10 years um so i don't like to keep messing with that portfolio until uh and unless i really believe that um you know i need to kind of tweak it because something that has happened in the market but i tend not to look at my portfolio uh you know for long periods of time and i think um that discipline is something that's helped me um you know over a period of time how often do you have uh, investment discussions at the dinner table with family members um not very much um um we only i mean well discuss about money if there is some big investment that needs to be made maybe a property that needs to be bought or something um but uh, you know being in investments and being a finance guy i think everyone in the household kind of leaves that decision to me um i find that my son now is a lot interested uh, you know in 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 the stock markets he's interested in businesses and in, interested in economics and uh, is now coming back to me and saying that look i also want to start um, you know investing a bit uh, you know here and there and i think that is something that uh, that that i like because even when you look at a lot of these uh, you know great investors who've been in the market uh, for a long time one thing that always keeps coming back is you know invest early and be disciplined i think these are two very important things that keep coming out in what everyone says if you have to talk about the passive fund manager career of a passive fund manager if somebody wants to start with that how do they go about it um well i don't think there's in a sense there's anything specific that uh, uh you know anyone needs to do per se to become a passive fund manager um obviously what is i would say you know which is a requirement for any finance guy uh, is that a basic knowledge of uh, you know maths uh, a basic understanding of how an index work and a basic understanding of how stock markets work i think if you have that basic understanding uh, you can look at the you know uh, being a you know looking at a career as a passive fund manager sure sure uh that's all uh, vishal uh, now let's this uh, let's end this conversation with a rapid fire uh, questions so i'll be asking a question and you can answer that in a line or two not more than that yeah what is wealth to you well wealth is being able to i guess buy what you want when you want hmm. index funds or etfs etfs buy or rent a home well at least your first home you should buy right because i think it's important for you to build that asset um uh, your first house at least you should buy one thing that drives you as a passive fund manager i think it's been different at different points of time so it's you know i can't kind of uh, you know put that in one word um 
initial uh, part of my career it was obviously managing schemes to the lowest tracking error that was possible at that point of time um today it's very different today i want to see how the benefits of passive can reach out to more and more people so that is what is giving me a kick at this point of time that i want to see more and more people getting into the capital markets um you know using passive products to help them achieve their financial dreams biggest lesson or realization professionally hard work pays your stress buster music what do you listen to music um so i listen to a lot of old stuff and a lot of new stuff i mean um um i like groups like you know fleetwood mac um uh, groups like well bon jovi coldplay among the newer gang of guys i like uh, weekend so um i like listening to a lot of uh, you know varied music and um i listen to it in my car i listen to it when i get back home so for me that's the biggest stress buster workout routine um i get up every day at 5:30 in the morning wow. i hit the gym at 6 um i finish my gym at about 7 o'clock aspiration or ambition currently uh hmm. to build zero the fund house uh, you know into the largest fund in india giving back to society i think for me it's again passive uh, you know uh, the knowledge that i have about passive products and uh, you know again reaching out to as many people um, with this again as i said um, to help them achieve their dreams i think that's the largest purpose at this point of time favorite in- investing quote um so my favorite uh, quote is that uh, uh the stock markets in the short term is a voting machine and in the long term it's a weighing machine could you explain so basically it means that uh, uh the longer you wait in the markets the more the size of your portfolio increases mm. the shorter you are i mean it's a punt so mm. it can go either way so right. in the short term the stock markets um is as good as the las vegas you're just taking a bet um on where the market is going to move but in the long term it's your portfolio will keep increasing and that is what will build weight i think that's what it means thank you so much vishal thank you so much for having us today uh it was really fun uh talking to you and uh, i wish you the best and congratulations for the zero the amc thank you